I'm Peter Blanc at the Virtual American Heart Association uh, annual meeting. It's virtual this year. With me are Kim Eagle and Deepak Bhatt. Kim from Michigan, Deepak uh, from Boston. And we're going over the Monday day, which is full of really interesting trials. We have five trials to go through, actually six, and uh, a lot of work to do in a very short period of time. So I'm going to begin with a search AF trial. Uh, Kim, this is a trial that you like particularly. It finds out whether or not people are at risk for atrial fibrillation postoperatively and possibly stroke. So tell us about the trial. Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's, a, it's an important trial. It's really asking the question, if we search for AFib in patients after coronary bypass breast surgery who don't have evidence of it at discharge, how often do we find it? And how often is it asymptomatic? And uh, it used uh, monitoring devices like Seek and uh, other devices to look for AFib, about 330 patients in the trial. Uh, the group that got monitored uh, for at least several weeks had uh, a percentage of AFib found about 20%, tenfold higher uh, than you might expect. This is a group that had, a, I think, an average CHAZVAS score of four. And it really illustrates, I think, a, a new science for us. In patients that we think are at risk for AFib, should we be monitoring for it more aggressively, understanding that not infrequently it's uh, an asymptomatic rhythm? Uh, I think it's an important study. We need more information, but I, I liked it. One quick question, Kim. How do you find the at-risk at patient? Who are they? I thought that everyone was at risk after surgery. So this, this trial looked at patients with a higher chads vast score. And it's, of, of course, ironic. That's the group we know with AFib at higher risk of stroke, but it's also a group at higher risk of AFib. Very good. Let's move on. We've got a lot of work to do. Fidelio, Deepak, Fidelio is your trial to discuss. Oh, well, thank you. It studied a drug called Phenerol, and that primary data from the study has been published in the Human Journal of Medicine just in the past month or so. What was presented here now is specifically looking at cardiovascular outcomes, patients with or without cardiovascular disease. Now, the overall trial looked at a little over 5,000 patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. It was a very positive trial showing reductions in renal and also cardiovascular outcomes. And now we're seeing consistent benefits in those with and without known cardiovascular disease and uh, uh, consistent benefits across uh, kidney and cardiovascular outcomes. So overall, this approach of using phenerenone, which is a non-steroidal mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, so it's sort of like spironolactone, except it's non-steroidal, it seems to me a pretty big advance in the world of kidney disease and diabetes and cardiovascular disease as well. Great. Uh, Kim, anything to say about this trial? Because I'm going to ask you about uh, Thales in a minute. Yeah, I, I think Deepak covered what we know currently about that trial. I'm happy to talk about Thales. Uh, this is a very big trial. 11,000 patients who had had an ischemic stroke felt not to be at high risk for bleeding, uh, ran them to ticagrelor plus aspirin or aspirin alone. Uh, and the ticagrelor group did better. There was about a 30% risk reduction in ischemic stroke. Number needed to treat about 34, I believe. Uh, there is a higher risk of bleeding, of course. I think the hazard for that was fivefold. But certainly did give, this does give us uh, another agent to add to aspirin potentially in patients with ischemic stroke who are thought to be at high risk for another one. You know, is, uh, I was on a DSMB once uh, that had to do with an anticoagulant. At the beginning, the really very smart people that were on it with me said, you know, we're going to give these people ticagrelor or an anticoagulant. They're all going to bleed. Sure enough, they do, right? But and it, it's, I guess it's part of what we have to accept if we're going to add one of these anticoagulants or even a uh, daptin, you know, uh, drug. It, it just doesn't let you off for free, does it? No, you don't get something for nothing in medicine, but it certainly gives you an option in patients that you think are extraordinarily high risk for recurrence, who perhaps have had a stroke, say on aspirin, for example. It really does give you a new option because based on this study, not specifically the secondary analysis here, but the overall trial, the FDA did grant approval for ticagrelor and aspirin for a stroke indication just in the past few days. Yeah. 
Yeah, ticagrelor is uh, really getting to be a drug that we're using more and more of, isn't it? It is. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Deepak, the next one is yours, Rhapsody. We have heard, you know, in the last years a lot about interleukin 1A and B. This is another trial concerning uh, that area. Tell me about Rhapsody, Deepak. I really want to take this one, Peter. Oh, you want it? I love this trial. Okay. I read it and I fell in love. You know, <laughs> treating- Peter, uh, You've got us fighting over the trials now. See what it's devolved yeah. to? There you go. There you are. You trained me to love this stuff, right? <laughs> so uh, Rhapsody is about treating recurrent pericarditis. Imagine that we could actually do a randomized trial of that. And these investigators did. Uh, and they used this drug called Rylanocept, which is an inhibitor of interleukin-1. They studied about 60 patients randomized and showed a massive reduction in recurrent pericarditis in the group that got this unique agent. Um, this is really an important trial, and even though it's small, it's going to change the way we practice, particularly these patients who are on steroids or on colchicine, and we just can't get them to stop either having episodes and or get them off steroids. This is a drug that's going to change practice, I think. Deepak, your thoughts, because I have some thoughts as well. I agree with Kim. It's a small study, but with big impact, I think, for patients that have issues with recurrent pericarditis, if this were available and I could reach for it, sure, I would use it. You know, we don't see an awful lot of transmural myocardial infarction anymore, but in the old days, Kim and I remember, we saw post-MI pericarditis, which was a huge pain to take care of. It, it was resistant. You couldn't do anything with it. Patients hated it. Doctors hated it. Now we have something that really seems to work. I'm delighted with this trial as well, Kim. I think you're right. Falling in love with this one is a good thing to do. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, Deepak, you were uh, the principal investigator of two trials, Soloist and SCORED, uh, another glyphosin or two other glyphosin trials. So I'm just gonna pitch this one over to you. Uh, Kim, you have to be quiet on this one because it's all Deepak. All right. Uh, I, I'm interested to hear what Kim has, said, has to say anyway, but uh, as far as Soloist goes, that was um, a thousand plus patient trial of acute decompensated heart failure. So patients with diabetes and admitted to the hospital with acute decompensated heart failure. And the randomization then was to sodagliflozin versus a placebo. And what was found was a significant reduction in hospitalization for heart failure favoring sodagliflozin versus placebo within a month of randomization that was significant. So an early, large, significant effect on hospitalization for heart failure with in-house initiation of an SGLT2 inhibitor. Actually, the protocol allowed for up to three days after discharge, but we saw benefits either in those patients up to three days after discharge or right before discharge, once they were stabilized. Obviously, if somebody's still on inotropes or, or furosemide drip or, or hypotensive or something, you know, we, we wouldn't have actually started therapy. So they were hospitalized, but stabilized, and then Half of them prior to discharge were started on the drug, about half were started in the, the ensuing three days. But in either case, uh, a large and significant reduction and achieved safely without issues as far as hypotension or precipitating renal failure or the other things you might have worried about starting a drug like this where there is some degree of diuretic effect in the context of someone who's just admitted with acute decompensated heart failure. So. I think this is really going to change practice with respect to use of early SGLT2 inhibition in patients with acute decompensated heart failure. So what about SCORE, the GFR issue? Sure, so with respect to SCORE, well, that was a trial of over 10,000 patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. This was uh, uh, an outpatient uh, type uh, trial, so stable patients. And here we also saw with the same uh, drug, a significant reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. And interestingly as well, there was a reduction in MACE. Uh, in fact, when we looked at total MI and total uh, numbers of strokes, significant reductions in each of those, you know, over a 30% uh, relative uh, risk reduction with benefits that were kicking in remarkably early, about three months or so after randomization and the reduction in MACE was significant in the stable population. These weren't people you know, with an acute MI or an acute stroke. So I think it shows that there's a really early benefit here. Now, um, you know, we didn't see a significant reduction in kidney endpoints in this trial, but I should point out both trials ended up uh, ending a little bit earlier than we'd wanted because of COVID. 
So, you know, it was a, a bit of a, a casualty of COVID as many clinical trials have and will be, but fortunately both trials still met their primary endpoint because the effect size uh, was both uh, larger than we had anticipated and was occurring sooner than we anticipated. So Kim, let me th throw this one at you and then I'm gonna ask Deepak to put in his thoughts as well. Uh, we've we've hear a lot over the last years about the glyphosins, right? Is this a class effect? I'm gonna ask keep Deepak also to say, okay, what's different about your drug versus other drugs? Or is there no difference? Kim, what are your thoughts? Is this just simply a class effect and we're seeing, you know, we're cutting smaller and smaller pieces of the pie to figure out differences? What do you think is going on? Well, I, I think it's with, without head-to-head uh, -head trials, it's, it's difficult to know if one agent is better than the other. But I think the point I would like our audience to hear is that I'm beginning to think of these drugs as heart failure drugs that have a secondary benefit on diabetes. And I think cardiovascular specialists have got to take this reign and say, these are drugs that help the patients I care for. And whether they have overt diabetes or not, the benefit is clear and we need to prescribe them uh, and prescribe them more. Deepak, your thoughts, is this a class act or is this a not so class act and actually some differences? Because there are some differences in your trial. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in the drugs, so uh, and in the trial designs, you're absolutely correct. Uh, Solos looked at acute decompensated heart failure, none of the other trials had, and scored. I didn't get into the details. Looked at patients across the full range of albuminuria. Prior trials had mostly looked at patients with CKD with albuminuria cutoffs of 200 and 300, but but we included the full range of albuminuria and found benefit and scored of this approach. So, you know, is it a class effect? I think some of what we learned is generalizable in a class effect, that is use of SGLT2 inhibitors in decompensated heart failure. I, I think it should be the standard of care with judicious use. Again, we were careful in these patients if they were hypotensive and shock, we weren't like here, have an SGLT2. I mean, you know, have to use a good clinical judgment, but in that stabilized heart failure patient without contraindication, yeah. I'd say use an SGLT2 inhibitor, but this drug isn't just an SGLT2 inhibitor. So I think part of the story is generalizable to the class. Uh, it's also an SGLT1 inhibitor. So SGLT2 leads to enhanced glucose exclusion in the urine. It's probably yeah, even all cardiologists know now, but SGLT1 leads to enhanced GI excretion of glucose. And therefore in patients with very low GFR and scored, we had folks, you know, GFRs of 25, 30, uh, even in that range, there was a significant reduction in glucose. So from an endocrinology or primary care perspective, now you can even get glucose control in that very difficult to treat patient with a low GFR. Additionally, the reduction in MACE, including in stroke, which no other SGLT2 inhibitor trial has shown, could be from the SGLT1 effects. There's some Mendelian randomization data, for example, that shows that uh, genotypes that are associated with less SGLT1 expression are associated with less cardiovascular events. So potentially there's an anti-atherosclerotic effect. That does need further research to nail down. I think there's more to, there's more to come about uh, all these drugs, but a fascinating group uh, for uh, Kim and Deepak. Thank you for joining me. Uh, day four, I guess this is, at the American Heart virtual meeting, full of goodies. We did a lot of work today. Thank you very much for being here, folks. Mm -hmm.